Welcome back. This is Today on ENCA. Speakers at a recent Defend Our Democracy conference have called for a national referendum on the electoral system. They say this will define the way forward for South Africa and turn the political system on its head. The question on everyone's mind is whether South Africans should demand an electoral system overhaul. Let's unpack this and other themes that have to do with the state of our democracy. I'm joined now by Professor Siswe Mabizela. He is the Vice Chancellor of Rhodes University uh, here in studio. In fact, uh, via Zoom, I'm joined by Asanda Nwasheng, who joins me from Cape Town. Good evening to both of you. Asanda, let me start with you. I made a comment just before the break that I was talking about systems as opposed to systems that are controlled by a decree of, from, you know, on high um, about, for instance, police activity. What does that say, the fact that sitting here, I don't know the 72-hour activation plan to be a system that I can count on to kick in and be implemented by the functionaries of the state that know exactly what needs to happen and how it needs to happen and there's accountability should that not be happening. What does that say, the fact that that's not how things work in our democracy at the moment? Well, unfortunately, we have a situation where, you know, you must understand everything that happens in South Africa is based on the history of South Africa. And so most of the legislation that we have now is actually a response to apartheid and some of the things that happened in apartheid. And so just a basic example, we do not have any longer the death penalty because it was used in the past against political prisoners and activists. And so we decided as a country that we were not going to have it in a, in a post-democratic South Africa. And so we are now kind of getting to that stage where 30 years after democracy, we are beginning to think about laws and lawmaking as things that need to be fit for the country rather than a response to apartheid or what happened or didn't happen in apartheid. And I think that, you know, policing is one of the biggest kind of industries or points of contention in South Africa, precisely because for the longest time it was used against particularly ANC members. And so a lot of how our policing policies, systems, ways of doing are based on responding to the past. And 30 years, almost 30 years after, we are really struggling to build a democratic kind of policing system. And we are struggling, as we saw with Beke Kele, we are struggling to even have basic things like being able to hold the minister of police accountable for the things that are going wrong without them being triggered by the apartheid system and what happened to him in the apartheid system, which also kind of calls into question our very understanding of how we come to these policies and how we come to these laws. And until we get to a point where our laws, our systems are built on the basis not of who is incumbent or necessarily what happened exactly in the past, but rather on the basis of what is the best for the country and how does the country move forward in a way that makes sense. We are going to keep struggling with this because even when it comes to basic things, like I say basic, but it's not so basic, electoral reform, constitutional reform, we still struggle when we need to make those changes because we are looking in the rear view mirror and not doing as much looking in front of us in terms of the windscreen, if you think of it yeah. in the analogy of a car. Professor Sizwe Mabizela, let me bring you into this conversation then. Um, one of the comments I made a short while ago um, about at some points in time um, having that sense of trepidation and wondering, will there be a sustainable republic for our children? Um, you know, part of, in fact, a, a big part the, the thrust of this democracy is for the republic to be sustainable, the various interests to be balanced, and the various expectations to be met as best as possible under the circumstances. But there have been moments where I've wondered whether there will be a country to bequeath uh, uh, the future generations. And I, I think you were saying off air that sort of resonated with you. Uh, pick it up from there. Why did that question resonate with you? 
Sheila Sinzo, that is such a fundamental question. Uh, given the context where we are, um, I've made the point that uh, our nation is in a state of crisis. We are on the edge of a precipice. Um, but we should collectively and individually as members of the civil society and as organizations play our role in pulling the country out of what I think is an abyss. Um, and so if we are to build a more sustainable, a strong, a vibrant, uh, and a participatory democracy, we as ordinary citizens of this country must take full charge. One of the tragedies of the transition in 1994 is that citizenry that had been very active, that was active in the mass democratic movement in the UDF, handed over to the elected uh, parliamentarians everything, and we then left it to them uh, to run the country. I think it is time that we reclaim our democracy as ordinary citizens, that we play our role and we hold those who are elected accountable, that they are responsive, and that we rebuild our constitutional democracy. And if we do that and we are engaged and we are participating in this democracy, we will be able to sustain it and bequeath future generations a better country, a, a much more vibrant society. Yeah. And of course, right, this me, is really the essence. Yeah. Uh, let me bring into the conversation now political analyst Tamsang Malinga, who joins me in studio. Thank you for coming through and joining the conversation, uh, Mr. Malinga. Thank you, J Pembe. Just your opening broad overview. There's yes. this growing sense that we've reached a point where we need a rigid we need reforms and we need them urgently so we can't afford to have a, a protracted process of reform that looks at the next decade and a half. But we've reached a point where if we are to continue to be sustainable and viable as a democracy, a few changes will need to be rung in. Where do we even begin? Yeah. I think, I think one, it's, it's impossible that um, we, we're going to achieve that as in immediate. Sure. Um, That's not as, what I want to do. <laughs> as, 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 as Professor Mobizala said, we, 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 we messed it up by just, you know, abdicating um, our, our rights as citizens into, into the, the, the executive and then allowed for uh, the constitutional and the proportional uh, voting system. You know, but what, what therefore needs to happen now is to start building again from the grassroots level because that's what is lacking. That's what Prof. Mabiza is saying. If you look at what's happening at, uh, at, at grassroots level, what's happening today, you had people shooting each other um, in a tavern and so on, and then you have one political party and one civic movement fighting instead of coming together. So it needs to start from that uh, from that perspective to say, let's build from the grassroots level in terms of what do we want to change. We want the system that says, I am from Dube Soweto. Someone who's going to be representing me is someone who's going to, in parliament, is someone who's going to be coming from my neighborhood. So let's start with that to conscientize people to say, this is how the system actually this is the system that we need. Yeah. And we start building from that. So the electoral system is for you key in all of this. I mean, the conversation yes, has amplified over a period of time. It's not a new conversation um, about the current proportional uh, party list based system that we have only party list based and as a result we had the litigation we had in 2019 and the decision coming in 2020 that said actually you should open up and allow for uh, ordinary uh, South Africans uh, to, to enter as, as independents. You are saying that changing that electoral system and those electoral reforms uh, would kickstart this rejig that I'm talking about. Yes, that, that, that is quite key. You know, we, um, I know the likes of Musi Maimani are advocating for, 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 for that. And it's, it's, it's basically going to give people the sense of comfort, of saying, I know who's, gonna, who's representing me. Sure. You know, I know 
that the issues that are within my community will be raised at the highest level of, 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 of legislation making in the, in the Republic. Let me try and get Asanda Nwasheng's thinking on that. Asanda, come in on that. Um, just on the electoral reform and placing citizens at the heart of it and, and, and civil, uh, civic organizations, etc. Active citizenry. It's great. It sounds great. But let me, let me play devil's advocate and suggest to you that I don't see the appetite for that. And I'll tell you why I say that. Musa Maimane, when you see what he's doing with the One South Africa movement, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not advocating for anyone to you know, follow uh, Musa Maimane or champion his cause or anything like that, but he's seen as someone who's out of a political home because in many people's minds, political home is a political party. You need to be activated and excited by one of the colors that are worn by people. Do, am I, am I, am I uh, too cynical about, about South Africans and their appetite, appetite for active citizenry? Yes and no. I think that, uh, you know, I want to go back to what Prof said earlier, which is that um, when apartheid ended, everybody, including civil society, including community organizations, basically handed over to the African National Congress. And so you'll remember that during apartheid, there were these organizations like the UDM, there was Sanko, and there were many organizations based within communities whose sole responsibility was to make sure that they were agitating for specific kind of needs and specific specific requirements and desires of communities. And what happened is that when apartheid ended is that all of these people were then sort of folded into the ANC, which then led to a leadership gap. And what we are experiencing now are the repercussions almost 30 years later of that decision, right? So the ANC start, likes to talk about being a broad church, and they're right, because they've brought in people from UDM, from sorry, from UDF, people from Sanko, and many of these organizations, and they have been folded into power and only now can be recognized under the Black green and gold. And what has happened is that these people started to move further and further away from the people and we're no longer living in these communities that they used to know and that they used to be able to kind of talk about with confidence. And so what is happening now is there's, a, there's been a vacuum for many years in leadership at a community level. And if you look at local government, it tells you what the repercussions or the impact of that vacuum has been. But what we are seeing because of the failure of the ANC over more than 20 years in governance. We are seeing communities now starting to stand up. We're seeing many, what South Africa is now talking about is vigilante groups are actually community organizations. And yes, they're problematic, some of them. But if you consider something like Dudula, it is an attempt not the best attempt, but it's an attempt by South Africans to say, we know the problems we have with immigration and we are going to try and solve it in this way. We are seeing a lot of um, neighborhood groups that are trying to deal with crime, for example. And a lot of the methods that they used are vigilantism, precisely because policing has failed, precisely because all the other elements of systematic kind of dealing with and engagement with issues have failed. And so you having this vacuum being filled by these vigilante, these highly problematic groups in that they're not always thinking about all the members of society and they're not always thinking about who is missing from these conversations and how, you know, there's discrimination, there's Afrophobia and all of these things that come into it. But what I'm saying is that because the initial step was about folding everybody into the ANC, all the leadership we could potentially have left. And then a new group of leadership has now come. And what this electoral system reform allows us to do is to begin to allow to have various interest groups who have decided that immigration is what I want to talk about, that you know GBV is what I want to talk about, that whatever issue is what I want to talk about are suddenly going to have the opportunity to contest. And I think even people like Musi Maimane, by the way, are going to be very important because 
Just because the DA has decided that he's no longer worthy or useful, it doesn't mean he no longer has support. So he could be sitting with millions of South Africans who could potentially vote for him or who could potentially vote for many other people who used to be the DA. As we've seen, for example, with Herman Mashaba, that he left the DA, but under Action SA, he actually got quite a large chunk. If you think about going from zero as a party to the, the percentage that he managed to get, particularly in Gauteng, you're able to see that people actually do have people that they trust and that they engage in, and they will engage those people even outside of a political party. The Let problem with the political party that. in South Africa. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll give him an opportunity, sorry. Sorry, uh, Prof Mabizela, weigh in on that. Uh, so it seems uh, Asanda and I are, d you know, we differ in, in, in our outlook uh, in that it would seem on this question, let me be very specific on this question, I perhaps am a class half empty uh, kind of person and she's a class half full uh, kind of person on this. Are you also seeing uh, this, this, this sea change that says citizens are fed up and are starting to reclaim their power. And I take the points she's making, uh, that some of these groups, uh, these groupings, that we, to use a, uh, the parlance of political uh, activists, especially in the ANC, that we problematize, um, actually are in a way responding to uh, the, the, the shoe that pinches communities. So the electoral reform we are talking about, do you see it being taken full advantage of by communities that will say, actually, this far and no further with these political parties that have continued to let us down, that don't hold each other to account, even in Parliament? Fila Sizwe, as citizens of this constitutional democracy, we demand three things. We demand accountability, we demand transparency, and we demand responsiveness on those whom we have entrusted with the responsibility to lead. Um, I must say that I'm deeply disappointed in our parliament, which is less of a deliberative space, but a site of theatrics. Uh, it fails to discharge its constitutional responsibility. It fails to hold the executive accountable. Parliamentarians are beholden uh, to their political parties, and they do not act according to the dictates of their oath of office and their conscience. And until we are able to deal with that and have a system that makes it possible to balance the role of a political party and the role of a parliamentarian in line with their uh, oath of office and their in the decades of their conscience, we will always have a problem. So I would like to see a reform which allows that balance to be there so that if someone wishes to act according to their oath of office, yeah. they're able to do so without being purged by their political parties. Of course, as I've said, ordinary citizens must take charge. Let me stick with you for a moment, uh, Prof Mabizela, to pivot the conversation towards the other element uh, that we had said we would raise in this conversation, the element around new ideas, new energy being infused into governance. Are you seeing that? Are you seeing any new ideas, new leadership, um, or are we at a point where, you know, the leadership we have, politically at least, is tired uh, and out of ideas? And, and, and if that's the case, how much of a problem is that um, because we have institutions, well, you know, at least the Constitution talks about us having institutions, so why should it matter whether we have the leadership? Uh, if the institutions are in place and they, they function properly, they should uh, bridge the gap, shouldn't they? I'm really excited with the work which is done by Defend Our Democracy. Uh, they had a conference in the beginning of, of July. And there are some really exciting ideas that are coming forward. And among these, for example, is that we need to have a professional public service where you are able to recruit people with the necessary skills, with the necessary attitude and values to serve this community. 
and ensure that there is no political interference. There is depth of leadership in this country. It's just that people have become apathetic, they've become disengaged, they've become disillusioned with the state of affairs of this country. But I think the work which is being done by Defend of our, our Democracy, pulling together the civil society and pulling together the organizations, the labor, faith-based organizations, and all of them to say, let's now reclaim our democracy, let us rebuild it, and let us take it forward. And of course, we will be building on the work which was done through the State Capture Commission uh, by first holding accountable those who enabled the state capture. Uh, and so this is some of the work that needs to be done. Tula Siswe, there is no dignity, nor is there any virtue in poverty. And we must address issues of poverty. Uh, and there are good ideas that are coming through on how we can do that. We have an army of unemployed youth, and they pose a serious threat to this country. We need artisanal skills to drive the economy of this country. So there's just so much, yes, there is leadership, just that we need to get people getting excited again about the future of this country and instilling a sense of hope yeah. uh, for a better and a brighter future. Tamsang Ngamalinga, weigh in on the same question around um, why it is important for us to address these reforms that we are talking about, yeah. particularly in the context where we, we hear about talk of a capable state, but in many instances we don't see evidence of a capable state. Yeah. Um, I think if, if I were to answer that, um, if, and, and looking at what, and, and just, um, just going back to what Prof has just said, um, he says that there is depth in terms of leadership in the country. But the problem is there is lack of leadership in party politics. And that, therefore, cascades into a, a messed up state, um, if, if I were to uh, borrow from Advocate Tifo. You know, it, it, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it cascades into a state which we, which we find ourselves in. But if we then say, now we, we, we want to reform, we, we are a capable state, let us therefore look outside of politics. Let us not confine ourselves into politics. You know, um, when, when you talk about the issues of do we have enough representation, um, I'm, I'm reminded of what we went through with the local government elections. With the local government elections, we had hung municip municipalities. You had parties that did not win the majority of votes. But because then people had abdicated their vote, yeah. they didn't have that uh, you know, right or for lack of a better way, they didn't have that opportunity to have a voice to say, this is what we want to see going forward. The party now decides. And within the decision that the party makes, they make their own coalitions. And some of the coalitions go wrong, some they go right and come back to the electorate and say, but that was not our mandate. We, we were giving you and, yeah. you know, how we then, we're not saying that as per our electoral act, let's go back. If you did not win outright, let's go back let's, um, and, and, and let's, let, let's run the elections again. And that can also, that can be done. I mean, if we go forward, we need to look at that type of a system. That's how we're going to be able to right. realize that type of a state. L let me quickly give uh, Asanda Nwasheng the final word on this conversation. Asanda, so what are the practical uh, first steps? For me, I would say then, if we're talking reforms, um, I would urge South Africans to get involved with this bill uh, that is before Parliament to ensure that we shape it in the way that we want to shape it. It's okay afterwards if you decide that you want to vote for a political party, but you should have the option to say, I know Asanda Nwasheng, she's been an activist all her life. I'm going to support her. 80,000 of us will and will send her to Parliament. Make me want to run for office, but anyway, jokes aside, I think that uh, you know if people are not sure why we need electoral transform, they need to look at private members' bill and the and how few laws were actually put into place by members of parliament who belong to political parties actually saying that we need this bill to be in place because our constituency needs it, and you'll see that 
the kind of changes that we need in South Africa are not coming through because people are following party lines instead of actually saying, I represent my community, which is X, which requires these kind of changes in order for it to work. And if you look at the lack, like if you look at the, the percentage, it's very few private member bills that make it to parliament every single year, which kind of defeats the purpose of having a parliament because what parliament is supposed to be is a kind of agenda setting, but also a law changing and shifting institution. And that hasn't happened because if the ANC as a political party doesn't believe in what you want as change as an MP, it's not going to go anywhere. If the EFF or particularly Julius Malema as the head of the EFF doesn't think that particular bill is important, it's not going to go anywhere. And so this independent candidate is going to be very important for South Africans because it's one of the few ways currently in the system that we are going to ensure that bills that allow people to feel like they're represented, allow people to feel like their particular and specific problems can be addressed. Because trust me, when you're sitting in the Eastern Cape, Durban, or any of the coastal areas, you have different problems to people who are sitting in inland areas like Limpopo and other areas. And so you need people who understand the problems of the coast and right. the problems of inland and who implement laws that will help make the changes that are required for the communities to work and make sense. All right, I've got to thank you for your time, all of you, and your contributions uh, to this conversation. It's just getting started uh, over the weeks and months. I do imagine that it will gain momentum. There was political analyst Tamsanga Malinga who joined me in studio, as well as Asanda Nwasheng and Professor Sizwe Mabizela who joined us online. You're watching today here on ENCA.